What I'm going to cover in the next uh, 30 minutes is the, uh, the trends of HIV infection in, AIDS in Asia, actually extend a little bit further to Asia and Pacific because a number of data uh, quite, uh, merge together. Um, Okay, so this is the outlines of my talk. So I think when we talk about the trends, uh, first thing we should uh, touch on the epidemiology. Uh, secondly, what the treatment and care and the use of ARV in these regions. Then we will cover, I will cover uh, a co-infection, uh, particular two main co-infection with HIV, tuberculosis and uh, hepatitis C viruses. I will then uh, highlight a bit about a number of key uh, research uh, in this uh, area uh, based on a, a number of cohort study, a number of implementation research, including uh, a few of PLEPs, uh, same day ART, and HVQO in our center. Um, I think if you look at the uh, global figure, since uh, about 40 years ago, so start uh, uh, 1981, the first case has been reported and is. And you see that 77 million people infected with HIV, half of them die in the last 40 years. So 35 million people die related to AIDS. And the most affected region in the globe is in sub-Saharan Africa. So about more than two thirds of affected population, you know, living in sub-Saharan Africa. The good news is that uh, when you have more and more uh, better ARV and more accessible, more coverage, and then the guideline have been changing the last, uh, uh, you know, decades from starting below 200 uh, cut off CD4 cell count to 350 to regardless of CD4 count. We should treat everyone and treatment as uh, at, uh, prevention. All that implementation together globally, the good news is that we start to see uh, the big drop of the new infection rate. So it's peak, I'm sorry, it's peak so it peaked 1995, uh, 3.4 million people uh, newly infected uh, in, you know, in 95. And you see here, it dropped about a half to uh, 1.8 million uh, globally. So that's a, a, a good news. Uh, however, when you look at the trend of the uh, new case infection is not every region the same. Uh, one of the most concern that you see the keeping, you know, a steep rising of the epidemics in these regions is the Eastern and Central, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, in Eastern and Southern Africa, West and Central Africa, including our region, Asia and Pacific, the incidence of new cases is uh, declining. The other good news is people die less and less. A half of people, uh, you know, had been prevented from uh, dying from HIV AIDS. You see that uh, back in 2005, the peak is about up to 2 million people die uh, that year. Right now we have 0.9 million people die recently. When you look at the current situation globally, about 37 million people living with HIV. And uh, again, about more than two thirds in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in our region, Asia and Pacific, we have 5.2 million people still living with HIV AIDS. And if you look carefully about the picture of this uh, uh, information from UNS, uh, 
5.2 million living with HIV, new cases still up to 300,000 people got, you know, newly infected each year in these regions, and still close to a million people die. So it's still a challenges that uh, we have to see. When, when we leave, review the pattern of transmission, it keeps changing in the last decade. I highlight in here in pink. So in some country in this region, MSM is the uh, main risk factor that, uh, that uh, they got uh, HIV infection. Particular here in Philippines is more than 80% of uh, in newly infected uh, individuals are gay men. Um, Pakistan about a third, uh, in Indonesia about a third, in Laos about you know 25 percent, in Thailand about uh, getting close to half right now. And other country, uh, the most common cause of transmission is drug IV uh, drug use. So people who inject drugs. Uh, very high in uh, in Malaysia, in Vietnam, and some other Asian country. This is the uh, detailed data of the pattern of uh, epidemiology among different risk group uh, in Thailand. And you can see that uh, MSM back in 1994 is only 6%. Uh, of total newly infected uh, population, but you see right now it's about more than a half, 54% of uh, Thai people are MSM. I, I try to look at the pattern of uh, subtype. You know HIV subtype is, you, particularly HIV-1, you have uh, more than 10 subtype and many uh, circulating form uh, virus, or CIF. Uh, the whole world, this is based on the sequences, HIV sequences submitted to the Los Alamos uh, a live, a database. And you can see that the globally, more than a half a subtype B. And the second is C, about 17%. In contrast, in our region, a third subtype B, another third is recombinant form AE, uh, and the third one is C, about 16%. When we look at the geographically of the distribution, so in green is B. You look at the high-income country or continents in, the, in, in America, uh, you B mostly, Australia B. Um, Eastern Europe B, and you look at the uh, uh, you know, in Africa C is the most common. In this region, Asia and Pacific, so B and, and A E combined. So in Southeast Asia, A E is the most common, and even among MSM, you know, A E is most common. In South Asia, India, Pakistan. Another uh, C, Papua New Guinea C. Uh, this is uh, Japan, Korea B. It's the most common. And anyhow, the so subtype heaven has any influence on uh, treatment responses or natural history in general. So it is good to to know about the pattern of. Uh, um, HIV subtype in terms of epidemiology or transmission link. Now I'm going to gear my talk to about treatment. So in high income countries, you have almost everything available, particularly the, 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 the newer drugs, uh, better profile. So this is in the principle, so what, whatever guideline, uh, you know, recommendation, we we'll start with uh, a backbone of com combination of one nook and combine it with another nook. 
the, the most common NRTI uh, have been commonly recommended or used so far is uh, either TAF, Abacavir, TDF is less, but it's still commonly used in a lower income country. And combined with the cytidine analog, either FTC or 3TC. And select the th one of the, you know, either one of the th uh, third uh, uh, group is the integrase inhibitors, one of that, or protease inhibitor, or NNRTI. So the one that I put in blue is the most recently approved in, uh, is, uh, you know, less than a year in general. So betacovir and doravirin. And uh, because of the a lot of uh, friendly prof profile of integrase inhibitor in terms of tolerability, easy to take, small appeal, uh, no, no food uh, interactions, so on and so forth. But another uh, very convincing uh, characteristic of this group is very difficult to develop drug resistant. And you can see this meta-analysis here. You see DTG, the chance to develop resistance is only 0.1%. So it's very, very rare. So that's why high-income country that be able to afford integrase inhibitor as a, you know, at the first line, we'll go for that. It's no doubt about it. Now, how about country that cannot afford indicates inhibitor. So what the WHO try to recommend uh, to, to select? Um, so basically, most of the low-income countries still have to go with NNRTI, which is efavalence, lepivirine, and, uh, and others. And, and you can see here, the recommendation say, saying that if any country or any com uh, you know, uh, area that you facing primary drug resistance of NNRTI above 10%, you should switch from a favalent based regimen into DTG-based regimen. So from TLE, TLE is a, is a single, pill, uh, single tablet regimen, is the TDF, lamivudine, a favalent to TDF, lamivudine, uh, doloticavir. In Thailand, we're still fortunate that the the percentage of resistance still below 10%, so we still be able to use NNRTI. Now, after, after you have risen to a number of positive trends and uh, some of the challenges remain, uh, I will touch on a, uh, some of the challenges that we need to overcome. Um, a few days ago, if you look at Lancet paper, this is very compelling and convincing data that U equal to U. What that mean? U, the first U is undetectable, equal to untransmittable. And this is study is based on, based on a cohort of gay men. This, uh, we, they, they study called partner two. Uh, the gay men couple that have zero difference, so it means one positive HRV, the other one negative, uh, about uh, nine, 972 uh, couples had been followed up for two years. And the result is very, very strong to, to, uh, conclude, to make a conclusion that despite more than 76,000 reports of condomless anal sex, the linkage HRV transmission rate is zero. So it's, it's convinced and confirmed that you equal to you. So if we treat our patient quickly and the viral load undetectable, in this study, undetectable cutoff is 200. It's not even 20 or 450 copy. So it's prevent transmission. So it's very strong information. Now, but in reality, so that the good news, very strong uh, uh, evidence. In reality, only 60% or less of 37 million people get access to treatment. So that's the problem. 
you try to treat them and hopefully when they are undetectable, they won't spread virus anymore. But it's not the case. And if you look at the goal of WHO and UNS try to put together 90, 90, 90. And this is the data, a global data. You see, the first 90 is not achievable. So it's only 75% known HIV status. And only 59% on treatment. And from that, this is the absolute percentage. Only 47% has virologically suppressed. In our regions, Asia and Pacific, the figure also a bit worse. We have 74% known the status, 53 on treatment, 45% uh, viral suppressed or undetectable. What about the treatment option in this region? So I asked uh, our colleague from, from Treat Asia. So this is a TAHOT. TAHOT is a Treat Asia HIV observational database. So they have a meeting last year, so they present this data. So I ask a big favor to, to show this data. Uh, you can see that the majority of people in this region still taking NNRTI, so 80%, and PI below 20%. Integrase inhibitor just down here. I would say less than 10%. So accessibility, it doesn't matter to get Integrase as long as you get, you know, NRTI, NNRTI that they, tor they be able to tolerate and control virus, I think we can achieve uh, uh, the, the controlling of viral transmission and also improve the quality of life of the patient for sure. And uh, Dr. Oka, very generous that I asked him a week ago whether he had any data and he Within two days, he provided me this slide. So I really, you know, would like to thank uh, a lot for, for his uh, support. So I, I, my question is that what the treatment option in high-income country in this region? So Japan is one of that. But you can see that uh, in Japan, um, new cases, 84% taking taking uh, integrase inhibitor. But it's, if you sum together, I would say it's more than 90% of uh, including not DTG. DTG is 84%, but if you're including, uh, this, um, this is wrong. This it should be alvitecovir. It's not f I'm sorry. Alvitecovir. So integrase inhibitor is more than 90%, mainly uh, DTG. And about a third of them taking single pill uh, regimen. When I try to map, so I asked a lot uh, my friend in this region that how they treat. Uh, so this is the information. Uh, NNRTI is still very common. Efavalin, nevalapine, lepivirin in Indonesia, Vietnam. In Thailand, uh, nevalapine is weaning uh, off, so we uh, start efavalin. And, and those patients that have high CD4 above 350 and viral load low, uh, uh, below 100,000 uh, copies, we, we start uh, lepivirin. It's very friendly uh, regimen. In Malaysia, Singapore, even Singapore is a high income country, they still cannot you know, support all patients with uh, DTG. In Taiwan, DTG is also a, a commonly used. Now, when, when we know that uh, only 60% of people in this world that are living with HIV get treated, and we know that majority of them still taking NNRTI, the other challenges is retention and adherence. And look at this data uh, from the Global AIDS Monitoring. I highlight a few countries that retention rate is less than 70%, and some of them even less than 50%. So you look here. In uh, Micronesia, I don't know uh, where, where it's the, on the map, but uh, you see this is 42%. Indonesia, India is about you know, 71, 75%. Uh, uh, New Zealand, to, to my surprise, uh, retention rate is only 63% in this report. 
So retention also an issue. This is our data in, 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 in a, a tight uh, national cohort based on uh, six, more than 600,000 uh, patients in the database. And, and we can see that death rate is coming down when you treat paper, uh, patient with the uh, earlier CD4 cell count. And this is the uh, first time that we be able to, one of our PhD students, uh, Celinda, have done uh, like expectation analysis from this cohort. And we found that uh, um, it's, it's normal right expectation when you treat an individual at uh, age 20 with ART, and you see that they can live, you know, 80 years as a life expectancy. So it's, it's clearly that this message can convince our patient uh, why treatment and adherence to treatment is so critical. I'm going to switch gear to uh, uh, to the co-infection, so going to touch on two major uh, co-infection uh, disease. One is tuberculosis, the second is hepatitis C. Um, you can see that the, uh, this is really uh, very shocking information when I, 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 I gone through the data. You see that the burden of HIV TB in this Asian Pacific region, so we contribute two thirds of new TB cases of the world. So two thirds of new TB cases located in Asia and Pacific. Secondly, MDR TB or lifampicin resistant TB, we contribute three of five, you know, three fifths. That's also a big number. And the co-infection about one fifth. Mortality of TB, we contribute about half of the world. So it's been this lesion is we're still facing serious problem of tuberculosis. So there are a number of proven uh, strategy to implement based on a number of implementation research. First thing to control TB is to scale up ART. If you treat them, teach HIV very quickly, universal t ART coverage for all uh, HIV infected TB, and then that will help to control uh, better TB in this region. The other uh, strategy that had been mentioned by the WHO is the three I. So intensify case finding, isoacid preventative uh, treatment or IPT, and infectious control for tuberculosis within the healthcare system and even within the community if possible. One of the uh, implementation research uh, done in this region, in this case in Myanmar, uh, they have done a study of uh, more than 70 of 7,000 patients, and about 20% of them receive isoacid prophylactic uh, uh, treatment. Um, and what they found is that a five-fold decrease in the incidence of TB uh, in this uh, uh, finding and the lower risk of death uh, related to TB. How about the hepatitis C virus? Um, you can see that hepatitis C is common in some regions and in some uh, key population. MSM, you're going to see uh, hepatitis C co-infection about 15 to 50 percent in North America. Among people who inject drugs, more than 50 percent of them have uh, uh, hepatitis C HIV co-infection. So this is one example in the Thai study from a Bangkok tenophobia study. Uh, it's a, a PrEP trial in the PWID. Uh, this population is about up to uh, 3,700 uh, cases. And you can see that the uh, prevalence of HIV is about 12%. And the confirmed hepatitis 
C infection by RNA positive is about 40%. So, so it's very high, uh, uh, you know, preference among uh, drug user, in check drug user. When you, I, I show you the uh, care cascade of HIV, but the care cascade of hepatitis C is the worst one. It's really, really worse because, you see, um, you anticipate 90, 90, 90, 90, but in fact, you have only 10% of people got treated globally, and less than 3% of them confirm cure. So it's still a long way to go in terms of access to care and uh, a care cascade for hepatitis C in, this, in the world and in this region as well. Now, uh, I'd like to highlight a number of uh, studies in Asia uh, before going to conclude my talk. So uh, look at the cohort analysis based on Treat Asia cohort and Australian cohort and some of implementation research and touch on a bit on HIV cure research in this region. So this is a very recent data uh, published uh, a few months ago uh, for the group of Treat Asia and, uh, and the, the pool data of the Asian cohort and the Australian cohort together uh, about more than uh, 10,000 patients. And this, the, uh, the FRAP is about 18 years. And this is the date. So this is the age related date, uh, 187, and 335 is the non age related date. And they do a, a, a calculation, look at the trend. And you look at that, uh, the age related date in this cohort dropped 80% in the past uh, 18 years, and drop 50% uh, in non aid related debt. So that confirm other, uh, you know, European and, and the, the, uh, the US cohort, and also the African cohort. Um, the other data, I think, uh, again, convince us or confirm that uh, we're going to face more and more uh, NCD, uh, uh, CBD related. Um, this study, from also from Tahot has estimated that in the next 10 years, we're going to have double of patient with cardiovascular diseases in this uh, HIV uh, chronic infected, well-treated cohort. And uh, a number of risk factors of uh, CVD, uh, at least four of them are treatable factors, although older age group, you cannot do anything much but high blood pressure, total cholesterol, high triglyceride, and high body mass index is, uh, is a thing that this, uh, so uh, care provider in this region together with the patient have to uh, taking care of this uh, factor. The other point I'd like to make also from a cohort, from uh, Treat Asia observational cohort is adolescent. Um, Adolescent, in this observation, uh, from 250 adolescents infected with HIV, about 20% of them have virtual failure at three years of follow-up. And uh, look at the adherence, it's only 60% uh, from, the, you know, from the study. And there's a quite a number of factors that are associated with the uh, low adherence because of if they smoke, if they have sexual partner more than one and others. So adolescent is uh, a group that not easy uh, to deal with unless we have pay more attention and have more better patient and doctor relationship. Um, now, I could share with you some of the at uh, Triad Court at Research Center in terms of uh, implementation research on same day ARV. IRT. So this is a population that had been uh, recruited in the study uh, up to uh, 2,000 uh, uh, individuals. And you can see that when we do a survey that whether when, did, uh, when did, uh, we found out that they have HIV infection uh, at the clinic, whether they're willing to start same-day ARV. The answer is more than 80% and some of them 
uh, more than 95% of them agree to start same-day ARV. And as a result, you see that 74% of them have received the treatment on the same day, and the other 22% uh, within the first day. So, so see, instead of we to head, we have to wait traditionally for several weeks or several months, you, you can have a patient majority, more than 90% treated within the first week. Um, and the retention rate at uh, one year, 90% and antitribal is 90%. So that will reduce significantly of HIV transmission if you treat them early. The other prevention implementation uh, research is PrEP. So implementation research is mean we cannot use a conventional funding mechanism from the government to do it. So what we did is we, uh, Professor Papan and his team have uh, a funding from the princess and uh, uh, Princess Somsoboli, she now has been, uh, uh, you know, recognized uh, as a, a goodwill ambassador of the UNS uh, for HIV pre prevention in Asia and Pacific. So you see that using this fund and using trained, not the conventional people uh, at, the, at the hospital or clinic to deliver PrEP, but we train key population lay providers to deliver free PrEP. And this can, exp this can contribute to about more than a half of the PrEP taking population in, this, uh, in the whole country. Last but not least, so I'm going to uh, bring up uh, information a bit uh, about the cure research in, in uh, the Thailand course at Lisa Center and search uh, research group. Um, basically, identifying acute infection cohort is challenging and you need a good teamwork. What they have done is that uh, they screen more than 300,000 samples in the past uh, uh, six years and, and 579 cases enrolled into the study and almost all of them received immediate ART. And so see, the average of uh, diagnosis of HIV infection, this acute infection group, it's 19 day. Majority of them, 91% are MSM. Interestingly, if you compare the, the, the black lines, is a chronic infection when you treat them. And the other line, in particularly the, 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 you know, the light uh, blue, is the free big one. Free big one, you treat them very early, less than one week. So majority of three days after infection. You see that this is the, uh, we measure the intracellular integrated <coughs> HIV DNA copy per million PBMC. You can see that uh, it created a low level of total HIV integrated DNA in treated acute versus uh, chronic, <coughs> you see. And then it's rarely pick up any copy at all in, if you treat them the free big one. But again, even this, they have been treated for a year. If you stop everything, rapid rebound viral load is still there. So cure by early treatment alone is not the answer yet. So you need other strategy to treat. So to conclude my talk, so I think it's clearly that although over, overall the trend of HIV is to, in the whole world is improving significantly. However, in Asia and Pacific, we still have patients, more than 5 million people living with HIV, and up to 300,000 newly infected, and up to a million people die each year. So I think it's still a problem there. It's not, you know, and so, and why we are questing for a, an efficacy a vaccine and looking for cure, there's still a long way to go. So strategy to reach out uh, the care cascade, 90-90-90, uh, or even 95-95-95, in combination with PrEPs and same-day ART, we have ending is this epidemic in the next decade. So we thanks a number of uh, sponsors and collaborators. Thank you very much.